the title of the book that I'm going to talk a little bit about is actually uh, Inventing Iron Man, the Possibility of a Human Machine. But the real theme of what I want to talk about today is actually this subplot, which is where is the line between human and machine? Because some of the things I'm going to talk about get at some other ways of thinking about what Iron Man really means if we think about you know, the reality behind some of those things. Um, this is one of these shots that you see of uh, professors and scientists in their laboratories looking very serious doing things. Um, of course, we're not really doing anything except peering at a gauge that isn't on. And there's stuff in the background that's actually information that's not from this. Uh, but the picture looks pretty good. Uh, something to keep in mind, truth in advertising. But anyways, this is me in, in my lab. We do a lot of work trying to understand how the nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord, control your arm and leg movements during walking. We use arm and leg cycling also. So that we can better understand how to recover that coordination that you take for granted that this fellow right now is using as he walks across the room um, in a very nice way, excellent locomotion, uh, that he takes for granted because he doesn't have any injuries. If you've got a stroke or something, we're interested in trying to come up with ways to improve that. That's my sort of day job. Um, but I've always been interested in martial arts and I began martial arts training when I was 13. So without telling you how old I actually am, I've been doing martial arts for 30 years. Um, this is from uh, some recent trips to Japan where we do armed and unarmed martial arts. And I've took, taken all those bits of information about science and martial arts and how I got into science because I was interested in how the human body works and I was fascinated by skill and learning in martial arts. I got into science, kinesiology originally, and then neuroscience eventually because of that. Then a few years ago, I wanted to put together the information I had from some of my different activities and try to make more of an outreach effort to try and talk to the general public about science. And I hit on the idea that I had of trying to use pop culture icons like superheroes as common meeting grounds. So the first book I wrote, if I say to you Batman, Batman's one of the most well-known icons in the world. If you hear the name Batman, you get an image in your head of what that means. And then the idea was to talk about the science behind that. Is it possible to become Batman? What does it really mean if you tried? How does your body work? Questions like this naturally come up. Then, after that, I started thinking about writing another book, and I wanted to take another sort of idea of these human-based superheroes, like Batman's pitched as a human being who just trained a lot. He's not like Superman who came from another planet, or Spider-Man who got bit by a radioactive spider, which is kind of a dodgy origin story, but anyways, that's his deal. He's more of a real person somehow. Same thing goes for Iron Man, where you've got this idea that you could have a robotic suit of armor and somehow enhance your abilities. So the most recent book that I wrote, which just came out um, a couple months ago, or this fall, is called Becoming, uh, Inventing Iron Man, The Possibility of a Human Machine, where now I'm still using that idea of a pop culture icon. Lots of people know who Iron Man is, particularly from the Iron Man 1 and 2 movies that have come out, and more are coming. Um, to think about what does it really mean, the science behind that? What is the science behind the Iron Man suit of armor? And what would it really mean if it existed? Those are questions I ask. For those of you who actually don't know who Iron Man is, this is Iron Man's first appearance in uh, comic books. Back in 1963. Just like that other here I mentioned Batman, who did not have his own comic book originally. He was in detective comics. Iron Man didn't either. He started off in Tales of Suspense. And we can see here this kind of a very sturdy, metallic, armed looking figure standing here, this Iron Man, and says, who or what is the newest, most breathtaking, most sensational superhero of all? Oh, sorry, of all? Question mark? Uh, Iron Man, he lives, he walks, he conquers. And it's been now almost 50 years since Iron Man hit, hit the pages of these comic books, and this is how he was shown. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we know about Iron Man based on something like that. This is what we see of Iron Man pitched in the movies. This is a little video clip from the first Iron Man movie. Let's see if we can get the sound up a little bit. What you can see here, it's a bit dim, but what you can see here is Tony Stark, uh, the character played, uh, uh, who is the sort of human being inside the Iron Man suit, being dressed up in the armor and putting on all this fantastic suit of armor so he can do all the kind of cool things we think about for a superhero like Iron Man. So you get this fantastic robot putting a robot suit of armor on him, and now he can get ready, and in a moment he'll have his face plate on, his helmet, and he'll be ready to uh, take off as Iron Man. So that's what we think of now. We think of, wow, superhero like Iron Man, look what that can do. I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a secret. We don't currently have the technology to even dress Iron Man let alone actually have an Iron Man suit of armor like that. But we're going to talk a little bit about what we do have. 
That's one of the coolest things I found about that movie, looking at the stuff that was just kind of thrown in there, like this crazy robot that can do all kinds of stuff to make the suit of armor that is even more outside of our reach right now. But let's talk about what is the main kernel of the kind of thinking I went through when I wrote this book, and I'd like you to go through with me as we talk about some of these ideas. And that is the linking between machines and bodies, and the idea of connecting biology to technology. We've got technology all over the place. You're using technology on a daily basis. You have a cell phone, this technology. You've got, you push the door opener to come into this technology. There's all kinds of pieces of technology. A limitation, and I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad limitation, but a limitation of our ability to use technology is our biology. It sets a limit on what we can actually do. However, if you begin to think of technological advances and connecting the body to technology, we now begin to move something closer to this human machine concept. But what would happen to the body if you did connect it to a machine? As I'm going to talk to you about now, what if you connect it to something as fantastic as a suit of armor like Iron Man? Iron Man then really represents the ultimate enmeshing of technology with the human body, combining together as it does brain, body, and, and jet-powered rocket boots as we saw him flying a moment ago. Now, how close are we right now, our society, our technology, our science, our engineering, how close are we to this kind of what we would call a brain-machine interface? And also, can the human body withstand the process required, even if that were available? What I've tried to do with my books when I've talked about su uh, superheroes and the science behind them is to look at the lens of science, what's available, what isn't, how it tells us about what could be possible, and also to look specifically at applications that are really important to me, like rehabilitation. Now, if we look back to this uh, old drawing uh, from Albinus, uh, an anatomist, from about 300 years ago, we can see a drawing of the human form shown as kind of a, a, a skeleton with some fascia and muscle and so on, but the skin's taken off. If we think about an Iron Man suit of armor, the origin of the Iron Man, is it really taking this kind of body and adding to it a suit of armor, like a literal suit of armor, or I don't know if really this is the right, if you guys are up on uh, Monty Python, but I prefer the Black Knight from uh, the Holy Grail. So let's say we put the Black Knight's armor on top of the body. Does that really equal Iron Man? Is that all there is to it? Just putting something on top of something, passively like that. What about all this junk? All this junk you see in front of you, and these are images taken from uh, the body work dem uh, demonstrations that have gone around the world where you can see fascinated visions of the human form and anatomy and, uh, and anatomical diagrams and, and pieces of the body. This represents sort of sketching together of showing the brain and the peripheral nervous system and the spinal cord also shown in here. So this idea that there's this network of connections all across our bodies. That's the stuff you normally use all the time to walk around, to move, to do whatever you're doing, to interface with technology, to not do anything. Your nervous system is in the background coordinating and networking all of that stuff. What would happen to this stuff if you just jammed that suit of armor on top of it? And would you really be able to control anything with it? And could you maybe use the nervous system to control all that stuff? That's the, one of the main questions. So in my book and for our discussions here, even though, as I just said, we don't have the technology for the Iron Man suit of armor right now, let's pretend that we did. What if the Iron Man suit of armor really did exist. What if you had a suit of armor that could do these kind of things like we see in the comic books or in the movies, that a person could put on the suit of armor and fly around and do things? How would this work? How would you be able to control this thing, this automated robotic suit of armor? I'll tell you right off the top, the thing that you normally would think of isn't going to work. You can't wear it just like clothing. You could build a suit of armor, and as we'll talk later, there are robotic exoskeletons available today that you can wear over top of what you're doing that do some things like amplify your strength. But you could never rip around and fly and, and fight people and do all kinds of things. They're too slow. They follow your movements. There's too many delays involved. It's kind of like if you've ever been on a bad phone connection, although nowadays it's, it's a bit better, or maybe a Skype connection where it's dropping out a bit and it's all gappy and you're trying to talk to somebody in Australia and it's all delayed. Hello? Hello? What? Or, yep, back, like this kind of delay. You can't get a conversation out of that. That's what it would be like to wear it like clothing. Instead, we need to go back to what I said earlier, to go back in order to go forward, which is to connect the tech to the biology and to the body. When we think of it this way, Iron Man and the Iron Man suit of armor becomes a biological control problem. How do we connect it? It becomes what's called a neural prosthetic. 
That's the idea of using a device that your nervous system could control to amplify your function or make up for something. A prosthetic is usually used to prosthetic limb, make up for something that's been lost. And it becomes something that's called a brain machine interface. And that's the main way I'm going to talk to you about the Iron Man suit of armor and all the kind of crazy things that happen if you think of it that way. Something which involves connecting the brain and nervous system to a machine. And what are the implications for what it means to be human? And that's where this idea of where's the line between human and machine. What, what happens to who you are when you're now not just you and your body, you're also connected to something.